Today we're going to go back over some of the material we did last time. Most of the time when I present the theoretical steps and how to correct for heteroscedasticity, people don't get it. They, they, they leave this room confused. And if I leave it at just a theoretical part, that, sometimes that confusion never goes away. So I'm going to go on the computer and show you how to do everything I talk about in eViews with an example very similar to one of your homework. When I do that, normally the lights start going on, people start getting this. And so stick with it, keep paying attention, and hopefully at some point this will all click together and become clear. This is going to happen every time we hit a new procedure. You're going to start out feeling like you're not quite getting it and you're a little confused, and we'll just keep going over it and going over it and doing examples until you see how it works. And most of the time, people with re repetition with examples are able to get what they need to get. And so that's what my goal today is. So let me reset the table. We only talked last time about the steps for one of our three methods. And so let me reset the table, go back through how we do it, and then I'll do an example. Then we'll go on to some new types of tests that we haven't covered. One called the gold Del quant and one called the Whites test. But we're still back on these, these LM tests. Now we have four basic forms of heteroscedasticity that we've talked about so far. Remember the issue was, we have K parameters, and there's one variance for every observation, so there's N variances. And if we try to estimate N variances and K parameters, we get N plus K things to estimate. That's more than we have pieces of data, and you can't do it. So our solution to that was to parameterize the variance into a few parameters. To write down a model that if we estimate four or five parameters, we can characterize every variance at every point in time. So instead of estimating n things, we only have to estimate five things. And we wrote down four basic models of a variance that parameterize it and reduce the number of parameters. And we only really focus so far on three of those. But let me write down. One of the models we talked about is that sigma i squared is alpha sigma squared. So that's one way to model the variance. And sometimes later, we'll have it, I, I, I said this wrong, ah, alpha zi squared. I'm sorry, that's my fault, Just I screwed that up. And this is i equals 1, 2, and this is usually one of the x's in the model. So you know this. You want to know all n of these. Since you already know the z's, the data, you only have one parameter to estimate. So with k plus 1 things, you can get all the variances. The key, though, is if this is a good or a bad model of the variance. If this is a bad model of the variance, this is a bad thing to do. If the variance actually follows a process close to this, then it's a good thing to do. So we're going to write down several models, and I'll show you an example today where I use a graph to question the model I actually use. So I'll, I'll give you some indication how to do this model selection as we go through. But the point is we just have a variety of models to capture a variety of different <coughs> ways in which the variance might evolve with the data so that they were flexible. If we pick the right one exactly, these parametric approaches are the best way to go. Okay. So we'll have one model, we'll have another model, so well, sigma i squared is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2i two plus alpha 3 z 3i plus z alpha p z pi. That, that's one of our, this is, we haven't really focused on this model yet, I'll come back to it, but that's one we'll use. We, we talked about this one last time, gave it a name. We talked about one where it was sigma i equals alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2 i plus alpha p z p i. Oh, I left a term out, but yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Alpha 3 z 3 i. Then we had one that was the log of sigma squared i equals alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2 i. 3i plus alpha p z p i. Now remember, the model that we're, we have is yi is 
beta 1 was beta 2 x2i plus beta k. Keeping track, that's 2. xki plus ui, where the variance of ui is sigma squared i. So it's this thing that's causing us the troubles. Normally there's no i there, it's a constant. So that's our model. And almost always, k and p are the same thing. Not always, though, and I'll give an example later when it's not. But almost always, k and p are the same thing. And the z's and the x's are the same thing. But I want to write down a more general model, because later on, we're going to have a test that is all of the x's, all of the x's squared, and all of the cross products. In that case, and that's a very flexible form that will fit most anything. In that case, P is bigger than K. Because you've got all the X's, all their squares, and X1, X2, X1, X3, X2, X4, all the cross products. That's a very flexible functional form, and that's called White's test, and we'll come to that. And so we want to leave open the possibility that P and K are not the same, but realize that these data and these data are mostly the same thing, or functions of the data in your model. It's rare that the variance will depend upon something that Y doesn't depend upon. But we need to leave that possibility open, uh, just in case there's, there's a difference. Okay. And then the question is, well, which damn model do I use to model the variance? If one of these is, is good, really close to the truth, that's the best way to go. But if you have very little knowledge about how the variance evolves over time, we're gonna, this is a parametric test. We're parametrizing the variance. The one I just talked about with all the squares and cross products, White's test, that's a non-parametric test. And so if you don't know the form of the variance, you just have no clue, White's test is best. If you do have a lot of knowledge about the form of the variance, parametrizing it will do much better. And we'll make that point again and again. I'm just trying to set some general ideas here. So we'll come to the, the, the non-parametric versus parametric test. I'll, I'll repeat what I said again later. Um, for now, I want to focus on these three parameterizations we talked about last time. And our basic procedure is a very simple one. We want to use these as the basis of a test for heteroscedasticity. And later we'll use these as the basis of a correction for heteroscedasticity. I'm not going to do that today, but we'll do it on the computer at some point. I'll show you how to do that exactly. All right, so what we're going to do in essence is estimate this model. That gives us the beta 1 hats, and it gives me a U hat. I'm going to use the U hat to make the left hand side variable over there. Either sigma, sigma squared, or log, because this will be it. That square is essentially an estimate of sigma i squared. And we're going to use that estimate to run those models. So we estimate this, we get ui squared, ui, or the log of ui squared as we need it. <coughs> we run these regressions. We get a test statistic, nr squared, and that's a chi-square statistic. And again, I'm going to write this all down in gory detail, just going to set in the table. Okay, I'm trying to get a general overview. Estimate the model, get the UIs, estimate this, form a test statistic. Now what makes this work is an important thing about the, we said if you run OLS on this, it's not a bias problem. The estimates are still unbiased. It's an efficiency problem. We're fixing the variance. But the bias is fine. Now that's important because if we're dividing this thing into two pieces, here's one piece and here's the second piece. If the betas are biased, this is necessarily biased and we get a biased estimate of our variance. And a biased estimate of our variance isn't what we want. We want, a, we want an unbiased estimate of the variance. What makes this work then in part is the fact that these are unbiased. Therefore, this is unbiased. Therefore, I'm able to get an unbiased estimate and a consistent estimate of the sigmas. But if, if this were not, um, uh, if this were biased, I wouldn't be able to do what we're about to do. So that's a key um, result about using all estimate problems that, that, that makes it work. So what we do is we estimate this model. 
And that gives us u hat i. The estimated, this is the true one. We estimate these parameters. That gives us then an estimate of the u's. We use those estimates. Here, we use u hat squared i to model sigma i. Here, we use the absolute value of ui to model that. This is the example I'm going to do later. This is the one you do in your homework. Mine's harder than yours because of this thing. <laughs> um, and then for this one, you use the log of u hat i squared. So you estimate that model, and that gives us estimates of these things. We already know the x's. We already know the z's. Those are data. Those are in our spreadsheet. So once I have those estimates, I can run this regression, get nr squared, and form my test statistics. So there's no hat on the u and the absolute value? Oh, there is, but um, the wind blew it off, and we need to put it back. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that's just a... A typo. I told you mine was harder. So let's repeat. I wrote this down last time. I'm just going to repeat what I wrote last time so that we see it again. But I'm going to generalize it to all three cases. Then I'll do one. So let's go through that. I wrote down a bunch of notes and things I wanted to say. Why unbiased is important. Yeah, I got that. All righty. Um, so here's the steps. I'm going to keep that. Uh, I'm going to run out of room. Oh, well. Such is life. So what's our first step? We regress one on one. we gotta, we got to get the U hat. So we regress Y on. This is just already in your notes. On a constant and the xi. If I put an xi's, last year someone said, What's that stupid subscript on, on the x's? That's just xi's, it's an s. <laughs> okay, let me do it right. On a constant, x2 to xk. So you run that regression. That gives you beta hat OLS, that gives you all these betas. Now you've estimated this. In your program, it's just there's a variable called resid. So you save resid, basically. But sometimes you have to form it. So u hat i is y minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat yi. x 2i minus beta k hat x k i. So estimate this model, recover the UI hats. The program does that for you automatically, and it's called resids. Then if I call this A, B, and C, 3A is to square the U hat I that you got to get U i hat squared. And then regress on a constant. Run that regression. Constant for alpha 1 and z2 through zp. Now let me stop for a second and let you catch up and see if you can read all my writing. I see some squinting going on which is my fault, not yours. <laughs> so which, what can't you read? So this says, uh, regress yi on a constant x2 to xk and recover beta hat OLS. Save resid. Or equivalently, form u hat i for the y's minus the beta hat x's. 3a is the square of the ui hat you get to get ui hat squared to regress that on a constant and the z's. 3b would be what? You'd find the absolute value 
of u hat i. Oops. The absolute value of the absolute value. I wrote one in. You find the absolute value of u hat i. In the program, as we'll see, you say abs u hat equals abs parenthesis u hat close or abs parenthesis resid close. So there's a function called abs that gives you the absolute value. If that function wasn't there, I'd just square it, take the square root. That's the same thing as doing the absolute value. Take the positive root. It always gives you the positive root. All right, so uh, there we have it. Find ui hat, regress ui hat on a constant z2 up to zp, or 3b, form or find the log of u hat squared i, and then regress, that would be 3c actually, regress the log of u hat i squared on a constant z2 to z We are essentially, the hard part's done. Now you just look on the printout. You run this regression, A, B, or C, depending. You look on the printout, and you find, make sure I do this the same way. You compute the LM stat. <coughs> LeGrand's multiplier statistic. So Lagrange multiplier, because we're comparing an unconstrained to a constrained model, and we're looking at the difference between the maximum under the unconstrained and the maximum under the constrained. If that distance is big, you reject. If that distance is small, you don't reject. So if you've had enough math, you know, Lagrange multipliers are ways of imposing constraints on maximization problems. There's Lagrange multiplier problems. So this is a Lagrange multiplier because we're examining constrained and unconstrained models and looking at the distance between the two solutions. If the constraints are valid, it shouldn't matter if they're imposed. They should be in the data anyway. The, the two maximums should be very close together. If the restrictions are invalid, you're imposing something false on the data. It can't find the maximum anymore. It'll be very far away from the maximum because you imposed a false assumption on it. So you're looking at a constrained and unconstrained Lagrange multiplier system and looking at the distance between the two solutions. And that's what makes these tests work. So it's a simple unconstrained maximization and a constrained maximization. The constraint is what you're testing. If the tests are true, those are the same. If the, if the constraints are false, those are very different. So that's all the test comes down to. So we're going to compute this LM test, which is as simple as N, which is the number of observations, times R, that was a particularly violent point, times R squared. And R squared is just the R squared that's on the printout, the goodness of fit. Not R bar squared, just straight old R squared. That's distributed. And R squared is distributed chi square with P minus one degrees of freedom. Now let's, let's pause for a second and make sure we understand what's going on there, which is why I left this up. And then we'll, we'll finish this one. If all of these terms are gone, what do we know about the variance? It is equal to alpha 1. And alpha 1 is a constant. So if alpha 2 through alpha p are 0, it's a constant. That's true in every case. So our null in these problems is that alpha 2 equals alpha 3 equals alpha p equals 0. If that's true, you're just left with alpha 1. If that's true, then your variance is either in A If that's true, in A, your variance will just be sigma i squared equals alpha 1. In B, it'll be sigma i equals alpha 1. 
and it's C, it'll be the log of sigma i squared equals alpha 1. What's important, though, is that in every single case, it's a when you unravel this, it's e to the alpha 1, basically. That's a constant. If I square this, sigma i squared is alpha 1 squared. It's a constant. So that assumption for all three, that, that hypothesis for all three gives us a zero variance. Or if I have a constant variance. And there are p minus 1. You go from 2 to p. You leave out alpha 1. So there's p minus 1 restrictions in this test. And so it's, it's really that simple. H1 is just at least 1 is non-zero. So what you end up with is a chi-square test. Say I'm doing 5%. I look up chi-square of p minus 1 of 0.05 in the back of the book. That's the critical value. This is where we reject the null. That implies heteroscedasticity. This is where we fail. So th this is the rejection region in here. So that's our rejection region. This area here is uh, fail to reject. And so that's homoscedasticity because fail to reject the null means all the alphas are zero. So if your nr squared is there, you fail to reject and you have homoscedasticity. If your nr squared is out there, you reject. In the problem I'm going to do, this will be 5.991. We're going to get a value that's 28.9. We're going to be way out here in the tail and we're going to reject that we have homoscedasticity. Okay, questions? Yes? Is there, is there a pass squared uh, table? Yes, in the back of the book. It's, um, yeah. And what is but this don't, don't try to look up chi squared at 10% because it's, it's 5, 1, and 0 0.01, I believe. So there's no 10% values there. But, um, what is P? P is this number right here. In general, P will be the same as K, but it may not be. But it's just a number of things you put into this regression. All right, then let's do the thing. So I'm going to do what I just said to do on a problem exactly like yours. I'm going to do a homework problem, except instead of using this model, I will use so, with any luck, A, the projector will come on, and B, I won't screw up. <laughs> this is when I get most nervous, is doing things live like this. <coughs> Ooh, the light's coming on. I realized at 3 o'clock yesterday I did not have a copy of eViews. I had loaned it to one of the GTFs who was teaching this class and never got it back. And I was a little worried about that because I didn't know how to do this example. But Tim Dewey was kind enough to let me have his copy. So we're all set. So this is the student version of eViews that ought to be available at the bookstore. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So first thing you do, file, new, work file. You have to open a new work file. Now the data I'm going to use is not time series, it's cross-sectional. And there are 222 observations. So I'm going to check undated and go from 1 to 
222. So I'm setting up my sample period initially. So I'm setting up a work file with 222 alterations. Okay. Now I want to, so there's the work file. I want to import, I think you can drag and drop in the lab because they have a better e-views, they've got the real e-views like the student version. But I'm going to have to import. So I'm going to import an Excel file that has salary and years on it. Okay? So the first thing I have to do is find it, which fortunately I did this last night, set the directory, so we ought to be, ah, uh, what is this? Data for problem three, I think it's called. Data for problem three. So I'm going to open that. And now I need to tell it the data that's on the Excel sheet. You have to look at the Excel sheet beforehand. And the, the headers are salary and years, and it starts in B2. So I'm going to tell it, okay, it starts in, in B2, and my two variables are salary and years. So what we're looking at is the relationship between salary and years of experience. And do I have everything else right here? By observation, 1 to 222. Let's hope this works. That looks good. Those look like years. And those look like salaries. So I think we got the data in OK. That's always good. We like that. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to estimate a wage equation. And one thing we've learned over time is that A, you should use the log of the salary on the left-hand side. Basically what happens is if you look over time at salary, unlog, it grows in nominal terms like that. It's a nonlinear growth. When you take the log of that, it tends to make it look linear. So once I put a log here, I get the more linear looking relationship. And so I avoid misspecification errors. So that's one reason for using a log, because when you have a growing variable underneath, you want, to, you want to flatten that out, and taking a log usually doesn't. This is usually something like e to the ax. You take the log of it, you just get ax, and you get a linear kind of a thing. All right, so the model I want to run is very simple. It's a wage equation. So we're going to run the log of salary on b1 plus b2 years plus B3 years squared. We've learned that if you don't put years squared in these, in these equations, you get the wrong answer. I should have left it out, because then I'd really get heteroscedasticity. But we're going to get it anyway, so I didn't have to. So you get plus beta 3 years squared plus ut. So that's the model I want to estimate. And then I want to test for heteroscedasticity, and I'm going to use model B. That is, I'm going to say that the log of sigma i is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 years plus alpha 3 years squared. So I'm going to use the x's just like I said. P and k are going to be the same in this particular case. So I'm going to model the variance exactly with the same variables here. Yes, sir? Did you choose the which heteroscedasticity model by looking at the model? or you just No, and I'm going to show you a graph in a minute that suggests I've chosen the wrong model. Okay. So I want to get to the specification. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> that's the part you're most, uh, which model do I choose for my project? We'll, we'll, we'll see. All right, so let us run the regression, but I first need to form the variables. So let me take options. What do I want here? No, I want quick. Generate series. Let's generate the log of salary. LN salary equals log salary. And if I spell it right, it's really going to work better. using an unfamiliar keyboard here. I usually have an external. Log salary, does it look right to you? 
looks right to me. It would work if salaries were negative, but fortunately you don't have to pay to work unless you're a bat boy or girl. All right, so there we go. There's log salary. What else do I need? Year squared. Quick. Generate series. I'll call it Y-E-R-S-S-Q equals. There's two ways to do this. Years. Hat two. If you don't like hat two, say years, star, years. Either way is fine. Hat is the exponent in this one, not star, star. I tried star, star. I didn't like it. This one uses hat. I get that right? Got it right. I also have new mail. All the way looking at it. Quick. Now let's run the first regression. So we want to run this regression and save the residuals. So we'll say quick estimate equation. And I want to run log salary on what's constant? C? Oh, it's right there. C. Years, years squared. Oops. <laughs> squared. Least squares. That's what we want. <coughs> Look good? Okay. There it is. I don't really care what that says. What I'm interested in, this series now has an estimate of the, vari of the residuals. If I run another regression, it's going to write over that. I like to save them, so I have them saved. And I like to name them like I named my problem. So let me just very quickly here, just so we have them available and they match, generate a new series called U hat equals resid. Now, no matter what happens, I've got that in a series, and I can't overwrite it unless I do something with U hat. So I run another regression of a different specification, and I'll lose my residuals. I don't have to go back and rerun this. So that, that's a good thing to do. Now, what I need is my left-hand side variable here, right? So what's it going to be? I need this thing. Uh, the... Why did I write that? I was trying to do B plus C over 2, and that doesn't work. <laughs> that was an error. It's been corrected. So how do I form that? It's the absolute value of U hat, right? So I just say generate options, quick, generate abs U hat equals the absolute value of U hat. That'll take all the u-hats, which are pluses and minuses. Variances are always positive. We can't have a negative variance. What we get is a bunch of residuals. We estimate a line, y-hat, we get a bunch of residuals around it. That's a measure of spread, just like that is, but that's a negative number. So we want to turn that to a positive number so it's a variance. And so we're just, we're just measuring the magnitudes of the deviation by taking the absolute value. So there we have it. Absolute U hat. Absolute is, uh, yeah. Sorry. I should have spelled it with just a T. Okay, now let's run the regression and do the test statistic. You with me so far? Not so hard? I don't know. I'll have to watch the video. <laughs> That's why we have them. So it's going to ask me if I want to get rid of this one when I do it. I'll just tell it, yeah, I don't care. Uh, estimate. So let's run the absolute value of U hat on a constant years, years squared. Look right? That's this regression right here. Okay. Yeah, delete it. There it is. 
Now all I need is nr <coughs> squared and compare that. Now I looked it up, the critical value for this problem, you would know this in advance. What's p minus 2 here? How many parameters am I estimating? One, two, three. But I only want to know if those two are zero. So how many degrees of freedom are in the test? There's two restrictions. It's chi-square number of restrictions. So this is a, a chi-square of two. So if you take the 0.05 value, chi-square with two degrees of freedom, alpha two and alpha three, this is alpha two equals alpha three equals zero, that's equal to 5.991. So that's our critical value. And we just want to know if nr squared is above or below that. It's going to be 222 times what? r squared is 0 0.130283. So let's figure out what the test statistic is. Uh, let's bring up a calculator. <coughs> I think I can handle 222 times. What I like to do is just copy this. And let's do the full <coughs> precision. Times that equals 28.9. I think I said 29.8 because I have dyslexia or something. But I was close enough. So that number, 28.9, NR squared is 28.9. So we should reject the null. Now I forgot to do the diagnostics. I promised I would do. I intended to do those along the way, so let me go back and pick that up. What I should have done at some point, so, so we have <coughs> the data indicates that we have heteroscedasticity. <coughs> So now we would need to correct for it. Now we know that OLS is probably inefficient. If this came out okay, we could do OLS, but it didn't. So we don't know yet how to estimate this handling that. We've only learned the test, but it's clear that, that, that it's there. Let me show you how I might te be tempted to diagnose this. Um, I guess I don't really need to. Um, let's graph. I want to look at the uh, an estimate of the variance. So let me take this u hat and generate <coughs> a u hat squared. Maybe I already have it, I don't know. So I'm going to generate a u hat squared. Now let's graph u hat squared against years. So quick graph. I'm going to do a scatter, scatter plot. And what I want to scatter is years against u hat squared, which shows me the variance at every t. I just want to look at that pattern and see what it looks like. Now when I do, what I see at the beginning, see how it expands? See how you got a little tiny variance there between 0 and once you get about 10, it begins opening up rapidly. You can see the heteroscedasticity in the problem right there. Now, when I look at that, boy, th this thing, you know, I've got, a, I've got some choices for how to measure this, this headers. I can make it linear, like this. That's kind of model A. Boy, that doesn't look linear to me. I can use the square, and it goes up. That's essentially what I used here, because when I square these, I get years squared, and this, I get all the variables squared. So this model is really the, the quadratic case. Because when I square this to get sigma squared, I get, I get all the x's squared. I look at this and I say to myself, you know, that's probably increasing faster than a quadratic. I used a quadratic. That looks like exponential growth to me. So if I were doing this for realsies rather than as an example, sorry to use that word, um, I don't know where it came from. Um, I would go back and redo this with model C, which gives me an exponential pattern for my variance, because I think that would fit a lot better. I, um, I guess I don't understand why you would need to use 
model B and C, because A would seem that it would capture and suggest to use more models, and wouldn't that be the only one that's, wouldn't that be? It'll one capture one? linear types. But wouldn't it capture exponential types as well? Uh, model A. Model A is just sigma squared is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z2 plus alpha p zp. So the variance grows with the levels of x's. It grows linearly. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether z is 1 or 10. And a 1 increase in z gives you the same increase in sigma squared. This is increasing far more rapidly when z is big than when it's small. Th this implies, that pattern up there looks like this. It looks like it just explodes right away to me. So it looks like it just feels like that. The linear model probably expands something like that. Now, I can make it expand fast enough, but if I go out there far enough, no matter, Given the data that I have, I can probably match it fairly well. What you're saying is if I open this, these jaws up wide enough, I'm going to do OK. I think that's what you're saying. But if I keep going, they're going to depart. So given any pattern, and I, my data is up to there, I can match it pretty well with a linear model. But the minute I go out of sample, I'm going to miss badly. And so. I don't want to use that if I'm forecasting out a sample or if I'm going to rerun the data over different sample periods and that kind of thing. It's not going to fit very well. So I want something, and, and, and another model, even though this fits very well, a nonlinear model might fit even closer, which, which is what I want. I don't think I've convinced you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. The other thing you could look at would be the plot of year squared. <coughs> and u hat squared. I don't see much there. Maybe a little bit at the beginning again. But, eh, you know, it's, it's harder to see the pattern there at all. So, looking at them, maybe, maybe not. This looks like a fairly, it just looks like it's, it's there. So I'd be tempted to um, correct for you. But we don't know. So what we do is we do a test. We look at these graphs and say, OK, it gives me some indication of which model to use. I pick the model I should use. I do the test. And then you, 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 you get an answer one way or the other. So that's why we do tests, because visually you can't always tell. And our brains are very good at finding the pattern in the data we're looking for. So if you're looking for a particular pattern, you can almost always see it. And so you, you, you need to let the statistics make these decisions for you. Sometimes it's obvious, but most of the time it's not. And so the statistics themselves are going to solve it for you. I guess that's it. I don't know if there's anything else to do with this. Questions? On that graph, what was <clears throat> it would be, yeah, you would see, you shouldn't see, you should just see a scatter of data that's fairly flat. So that the spread is the same everywhere. Do you see any slope at all to this? That's heterosclastic. It looks to me like there is, in fact. <coughs> You could get an upward slope on it. Yes? I looked it up in the back of the book. Yes. So if you go to the back of the book, your book there, there's a chi-square table. 
if you start at the very last table and thumb back through, it's about three pages in. <coughs> One more, maybe. Somewhere in there, there's a chi-square table. And in that table, it has 0 0.05, 0 0.01. Is it 0 0.001? <coughs> no, 0 0.0141. Yeah. Those two? And then, then it's got degrees of freedom. One, two, three. This number's right here, 5.991. So it's the point, oh, it's the 5% value for two degrees of freedom. Yeah. And how did you get 28.9? That's an R squared. That's, yeah, that is um, this number, 222, which is N which won't highlight for some dang reason. That number, 222 times R squared, 0.130283. Okay. So that number is just N R squared equals that. <coughs> oh, I already wrote it. <coughs> hmm? So if you did the graph, if you had squared, or you had a cube, do you have to afford for that to make it a separate R from the you could, you could. No, what I would do is probably run a graph in my other package where I could scale the left-hand axes, and I'd yank that left-hand axis up and just look at that range. The other thing I would be tempted to do if, if I had more time, the, the data in the spreadsheet are not organized by magnitude. I'd go back and sort my data by years. And then I would cut out the last 100, 200 observations and narrow in and focus in on those initial observations. I haven't sorted the data, so it's not going to do me any good. But what I could do is go here and change the sample. So I could make it 1 to 100. Now it will just give me the graph for the first 100 observations. But I haven't sorted it by magnitude, so that that 100 kind of randomly drawn across the whole axis. So I want to go to my spreadsheet. We'll, we'll talk about this more in the next procedure because you actually have to do this. Sort it by years, which doesn't change the regression at all. And then you can, you can plot the data sorted on the variable that looks to be the problem. And then, then you, can focus, you can microscope in on the part that looks like there's heteroscedasticity. I actually did that last night at home, but I, I didn't. Did that help? Yeah. All right. Oh. Oh, well. I was going to show you how to do the third variable, but you already can do that. How would you form the third variable? I would take that u hat <laughs> squared term that I did and just find, say log u hat squared equals log parenthesis u hat <coughs> sq, close parenthesis. Then you have the variable for the third test. And I really think that's a better model for this problem. But I'm only trying to show you how to do your homework. So I'm going to stop right there. another test. I want to move on to a test based on this specification. So let's move on to a test based upon the model of the variance. Sigma i squared equals alpha z i squared.
and it's called the Goldfeld Quant Test. So this is going to be the, the Goldfeld Quant. Let me double check that D. And it is there. Good. Do you guys do chow tests? Yeah. Dang. I could have said this is just a chow test for the variance. Then we'd be done. <laughs> okay. I do think so. What we are going to do. This implies a particular type of heteroscedasticity. It's either growing constantly, so here's the true line. It's either growing as the data grows, or it could go the other way. It could start wide and narrow down, say if it was a fraction or something. It just depends upon how we're doing it. What we're going to do is we're going to divide this essentially into three pieces. This piece, this piece, and this piece. So we'll take our data and we'll put approximately one six to one third in here. And we'll just throw that out. Now it's generally a bad idea to throw out data. And this is no exception. So this is not the best, necessarily the best possible test, but it's one that's easy. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate a regression for just these observations, and we're gonna estimate the variance. Then we're going to estimate a regression for just these observations and estimate the variance. Then we're going to take the ratio of those two variances. What's the ratio of two chi-squares? Do you remember the distributional stuff? It's F. The ratio of two independent chi-squares is F. Each one of those, this sigma squared is a chi-square. This is a chi-square. We're going to take the ratio of the two. It's an F distribution. If they're the same, if there's no heteroscedasticity, that ratio should be 1. So we'll take sigma squared from this, call it H, over sigma squared L, call it this one, the low variance and the high variance. If there's no heteroscedasticity, this will be near 1. If there is heteroscedasticity, this will be a big number. And if it's a big number, we want to reject homoscedasticity at some point. So as these get more and more different, at some point we'll reject, and that point's given to us by an F test. So it's very simple. Order your data according to magnitude of some variable. So this is this is that XI. Um, let's just I should have said XI there. In this problem, ZI is XI. It doesn't, yeah, that's just Oh, apologies for that. So this is where I have to pause to give you time to fix it because it's my mistake. <laughs> I have no idea what I was saying. Yeah, so we just estimate this, estimate this, estimate the two variances, take the ratio. If it's big, we reject. If it's small, we don't reject. This is not a test anyone uses much anymore. I prefer the first three we talked about are White's test to this one. It's a good test. If you're sure this is how your heteroscedasticity looks, it's probably a pretty good test. But you really, 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 really need to know that that's how the variance evolves. And this test is very, very bad if your errors are not normal. So it's not robust to distributional problems. The LM tests are way more robust than this test. So this test relies upon a particular type of heteroscedasticity. If you have it, great, it's a good test. 
if it's not this, it's a lousy test. And if your errors are not normal, it's a lousy test. So people don't use this test much anymore. But I was just reading the paper the other day, and there it was. So it's something you need to know about. On your projects, I would prefer either White's test or one of the other three that we've done so far. So this is just something I think we all need to know about when we see it. It is a good test in some circumstances, but in general, I prefer different tests that are more robust. You need to know an awful lot about your problem for this test to be optimal. If your errors are normal and you're sure of it, and that that's the model. This model generally works when your heterostasis is caused by a single scale variable. And so if it's caused by income growing, like we were talking last time, or you've got sales or something like that, if there's a single scale variable in your model, this is probably a decent way to model it. But for any other circumstance, it's probably not a very good model of heterostasis. So it has its uses. It's not useless, but it's not the best test we've looked at. Uh, let me make sure I do this. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have this spreadsheet with y, x2, x3, xk. And you'll have data. From 1 to n. A1 to AN, B1 to BN, C1 to CN. Or, well, okay, two, but let's just call that zero because it's easy. There's N of them. First thing you need to do, let's suppose that I think so I have sigma i squared is alpha x. Let's say I think it's x3 squared. So there's my model of the variance. It's x3. Now, one thing we, that's bad about this test is I can't use more than one variable. The variance can only depend upon a single variable. If the variance depends <coughs> upon two variables, it don't work. We got to use the other ones we did. Those allow us to use p explanatory variables. Single <coughs> variable is all we can do. Okay, so we think heteroscedasticity is this column. So what I should do is sort on this column. So I sort by x3. So that this is small to large. It could be large to small, it really doesn't matter, but small to large is a typical way to do these. <coughs> then what you'd want to do, usually you throw out something in the middle, it's one-third to one-sixth of the data. So you just take that stuff, you don't want to delete it because that's your, your data. What I would do is make two different data sets. I would copy all these variables into a data set. That will be for this regression. Then I'd copy all these variables into a new sheet on my spreadsheet or a new spreadsheet altogether and use those for my second regression. Now if you're very good in eViews, you can do what I just did. After you sorted these, if there's 100 of them, I can grow 1 to 33 and 67 to 100. I can set the sample 67 to 100 and set the sample from 1 to 33, something like that. Uh, let's say there's 99 of them, so I can get the right numbers. Um, all right? Yeah. Um, then uh, you can do it either way. So whatever works for you. With me on what I'm saying? So up there on the, on the thing, there's a little sample on your regression. 
you just hit that sample button and change it 1 to 33, run your regression, keep the estimate of the variance, then change the sample to 67 to 100, or if you're throwing out 1 6, you know, whatever you, whatever you decide upon, the convention is somewhere in that range. The less you can throw out, the better. But when you graph it, if it's fairly flat, you want a wider swath because you want a big difference. If it's fairly steep, you can throw out less because you've got a distinct difference already. But you, you, you know, somewhere in that range. And the more data you can keep, the better you're going to be, as always. So that's all there is to it. So then you run this, run this, get this, get this, form the ratio, and it's an F. Now we need to write down the steps. So we have the cookbook that you can look up, the recipe in the cookbook. But um, that's it. That's the intuition. I hope. Make sense? Hmm? What about the middle? We just throw it away. And one reason why this is not perhaps the best possible test in the world is it's almost never optimal to discard useful information. And this test involves discarding things that might help us sort one from the other. It makes a lot of intuitive sense, but there's probably another test statistic somewhere that's going to dominate this one that doesn't end up throwing away data. And so, yeah. So why would you throw the data away? Like, what's what makes this better than another test? What I'm trying to say is it's it's probably not. Okay. And well, it's easier. It's easy. It's really easy. It works really well. It has, it has nice properties when the errors are normal and you're sure this is true. Then even throwing this away, you don't lose a lot in terms of the power of the test. But the minute you get deviations from the assumptions you need, this kind of thing really screws you up. And so. Um, as I was saying, on your projects, I doubt anyone will use this particular test. So this is more for your knowledge because you're going to see it when you read about it. Some of you are going to go on and, and, and do graduate work and things, and I need to tell you about this test because you're going to see it. And, um, yeah. I fully agree that yeah, that's never... I mean, you, you, you can do things... That don't throw them away. If you're worried about these data, there's another test where you can simply give these less weight and give these more weight. Now I haven't thrown these away, but I've downweighted, but I still have the information. If I pick the weight optimal, it's going to be better than throwing away entirely. But that test is not simple. I may not know its distribution. This is simple. I know its distribution. It's an F, and it's just it's a standard, easy thing to do. This is, this is one of the first tests that were ever constructed. Related to the variance. 
In these problems, as I was saying, it's almost always a, a, a scale variable. I'm saying pick the x3. Pick the variable you think is responsible for that. Pick this model. Whatever x it is. Then divide the sample into three parts. So here's variable 1, variable n. We're going to call this n1. We're going to call this n2. And this is 1, 6 to 1 third. And this is the data we're going to toss out. Now, I'm using a slightly different notation than the book. The book forces the number of observations here and the number of observations here to be the same. They use n prime here, and this is n prime plus 1. There's nothing that requires those number of observations to be identical. They almost always are, but they don't have to be, so I am not going to impose it on the problem. But almost always. Number of observations here, in my example was 33 and 33. So this would be the first 33 in my example, the second 33, the third 33, or however you want to do it. If there were 96 variables, what's that, 16 times 6? So you take uh, 16, 40, and 40, or something like that, for 1, 6. Did you get that right? No, can't be right. Anyway. 16 times 6 is 96. <coughs> oh, I see what you mean. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Didn't know. You ready? Not the last little mumbling to myself. That's just between me and myself. If I'm mumbling, you, know, I, I, you probably don't need to hear it. It's just me talking to myself about something stupid. Um, I should have mumbled that. So anyway, here we go. Three. Estimate two regressions. <coughs> one for the first and one ops, and one for the last and two. That's not a very good notation because last n minus n2 plus 1 ops. See, the number of observations in here is that minus that plus 1. You know the plus 1 thing, right? How many observations between 8 and 10? 3, 8, 9, and 10. It's 10 minus 8 plus 1. You always have to add that 1. And so the number of observations here is 10 minus 8. If this is 8 and this is 10, it's 10 minus 8 plus 1. I choose n2. If I, if I want them the same, I just choose it so that this number and this number are the same value. The, this is 33 and this is 33. So you just figure, you know, if this is 100 and I want this to be 33, then I know what N2 needs to be. Turns out to be 68. Well, 67 with 99. 100 minus 67. 99 minus 67 is 32 plus 1 is 33. So this number would be, this would be 99. 67 and 38. Okay? We're just getting the number of observations. Four. RSS one. The sum of squared residuals one is just um, the sum from t equals 1 to n1 of the 
u hat squared i. I run the first regression from the first 33 observations. You can get this off the printout. This is the residual sum of squares. Sometimes they call it the error sum of squares. So that's, that's a number on your printout. <coughs> RSS2 is the sum from t equals n minus n2 plus 1 to n of the u hat squared i. That's the last, that's that one. And that's that. Now, whichever one is bigger, put it on the top. If you don't know whether it's declining, well, yeah, just take the big one and put it on the top. In our case, we think it's RSS2. So let's just say it is. So now, form. So five, compute the F statistic. Compute F equals sigma hat squared two over sigma hat squared one. I'm sorry, I need to do one more thing here. Sigma hat squared 1 is RSS1 divided by what? Remember what the absolute variance is? It's the sum of the error squared divided by N minus K. So this is N1 minus K. We're running the same regression in both models, so I don't have to say K1. We're running the same exact variance for the first 33 and the last 33. Well, I don't have to say it's the same X's. So the K is the same. Sigma hat squared 2 is RSS2 divided by N minus N2 plus 1. Okay. The number of observations adjusted for degrees of freedom. Because we know in small samples, this is a good bias consistency problem. <laughs> sigma squared over n is consistent, but it's biased. Sigma squared over n minus k is both consistent and unbiased. And so in small samples, you have to adjust by n minus k. What happens is the ratio n minus k over n is it goes to infinity, goes to 1. And so the correction doesn't matter asymptotically. And so it's always consistent either we use n. But in small samples, that n versus n minus k can make a huge difference. And so if you use n instead of n minus k, you get bias in small samples, but you still have a consistent estimate. So always just, the, the message is, unless you have 47,000 observations, subtract K. And even if you have that many, go ahead. It's not going to hurt you. <clears throat> these then, so two regressions, read these off the printout. You can actually get this off the printout for most printouts. I don't know about yours. I don't know EBUs as well as I should. I think it's there. If it's not, you've done this in Jeremy's class, so let's move on. Okay, so then this statistic equals sigma hat squared 2 over sigma hat squared 1 is distributed chi square with numerator denominator uh, f. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a sign that I care. Um, this is chi square. This is chi square because they're different observations, they're independent. 
the ratio of two independent chi-squares is f. And the degrees of freedom are the degrees of freedom in the chi-squared in the numerator and the degrees of freedom in the chi-squared in the denominator. This has n1 minus k degrees of freedom. This has that many degrees of freedom. So this is distributed. Uh, this has that many and this has that many. I, ha I said that exactly backwards. But, so this is f with n minus n2 plus 1 minus k and n1 degrees. n1 minus k degrees of freedom. And let me look at my notes to make sure I didn't screw that up. Oh, wow. I should look at the clock more. All right, so uh, that's good because we've got about one minute left to finish this. So to do the Goldfeld quant test, you first Pick a variable you think is related to the variance. <coughs> Second, sort by that variable, which is much easier today than when I was your age, with no computers. Third, what you did is you took your cards and you reordered them. Third, um, I totally lost my. I'm gonna stop doing that. <laughs> Where are we? Divide into three parts. Throw out the middle. Three parts or six. Throw out one third to one sixth. Run two regressions, early, late, first offs, last offs. Form the variance ratio, big on top, little on the bottom. Pass the degrees of freedom, n2 minus k, blah, blah, and then do your test. And you're all done. And I am 10 seconds over again. I started 10 seconds late. Perfect.